All right, so I want to start by going back to something we talked about at the end last time, which was uh, this conflict uh, between the soul and the barbed wire. Now, Solzhenitsyn's main claim uh, seems to be that, uh, that some human beings can ascend in the most dire conditions, the conditions of the gulag, and uh, he doesn't really blame the other prisoners uh, for not ascending. He thinks that that's kind of a very human uh, reaction. Uh, but he does show the possibility of an ascent. And, and his most famous way, I think, of putting this is the last lines of the ascent. So the last lines of the ascent involve uh, not only a poem that Solzhenitsyn himself has composed about his experience within the Gulag, but his famous praise of the prison that he puts in italics, where he says, bless you prison, mm -hmm. first. And then the second, and this is the one I want us to focus on, the, la the genuinely the last sentences of the ascent, he says, bless you prison for being, for having been in my life. Okay, now that's his praise of the ascent, the way that the prison has forced him into the fork and to make a choice between his conscience or his life. And he willingly, it seems, follows his conscience. And then, and this is very characteristic of Solzhenitsyn, he engages in a dialogue with himself. And in the last lines, he puts in parentheses, and from the beyond the grave comes replies. It is very well for you to say when you came out of it alive. Now that, I think, is kind of the essence of uh, the question or the, the, the objection to what Solzhenitsyn had to say uh, uh, that, we, that, we, oh, that was raised last time. Okay, now, so he totally recognizes that his is, if I can use today's words, a privileged position for having survived, perhaps having been in less bad circumstances than other people in the gulag, um, people whose hands were genuinely worked to death, although, you know, I think that, that Solzhenitsyn, uh, his, his cancer especially was, I think, the big dire circumstance in his life. He, but he recognizes, I'm going to say, the privilegedness of his ascent because it is easy for him to say, since he did come out alive. Does that make sense? All right, so um, now, the impression that this chapter on the ascent gives is that human beings, if they have the right perspective, they can summon up the energy and courage to live under any circumstance. And this is what I mean by it's stoic teaching. It seems to be a stoic teaching that no matter the pain, no matter the conditions, human beings can be happy if they pursue virtue. The image that uh, you find in stoicism is the man who's being boiled alive in a self-contained barrel. They say, if you're being boiled alive in a self-contained barrel, you can still be happy if you have the right perspective on pain and can forget your body. Now, there's something extremely inhuman about that. And, uh, and you know, almost no one believes that that's a human possibility. Um, but let's go beyond that and say that it is not a politically useful disposition to have. No matter the pain, no matter the torment, no matter the tyranny, you can still be happy. That attitude is a recipe for tyranny. So while there is a kind of spiritual regeneration or what we'll look at today as moral improvement that is possible uh, in the gulag, that moral dis development is a political disaster. That's, I think, the central theme of the uh, chapters that we have to look at today. The two chapters we have today are Our Muzzled Freedom, Book uh, 4, Chapter 3. This comes after the ascent or corruption. And then Why Did We Stand For It, which is from the next book, Book 5, Car uh, Kartorga, 
um, which I think is the, is the political teaching of the book most explicitly, okay? Now, these two chapters, very disparate, you know, they're separated by, by several other chapters, but they have this theme in common. The role of public opinion in a tyranny. Our muzzled freedom is about the role of the gulag in shaping public opinion. Why did we stand for it? is about the role of public opinion in shaping the gulag. Okay, now it's always my method to do things backwards. Um, so I wanna, I want us to look at um, the second part first. Why did we stand for it first? And in doing this, I want to uh, talk a little bit about what we mean by tyranny, okay? Now, Aristotle is, uh, I'm gonna say, one of the first great analysts of tyranny. And uh, he, in book five, chapter 11 of the politics, Aristotle gives an account of how a tyrant can keep his rule by doubling down on tyranny. He says there's two options for a tyrant. You can become more tyrannical or more like a monarch. And the way to become a tyrant by being more tyrannical is as follows. Um, he says, uh, these are some of the things that must be done. Lopping off the preeminent and eliminating those with high thoughts. And also not permitting common messes, clubs, education, or anything else of the sort. But guarding against anything that customarily gives rise to two things, high thoughts, and trust. Leisure discussions are not allowed and other meetings connected with leisure, but everything is done so as to make all as ignorant of one another as possible, since knowledge tends to create trust in one another. Skipping a little bit, uh, he should also attempt to let nothing be done or said by any of those he rules that could escape his notice but to have spies, like the women, uh, the women call inducers at Syracuse or eavesdroppers, Hyro sent whenever there was some meeting or gathering. Also, a feature of tyranny is to slander them to one another and set friends at odds with friends, the people with notables, the wealthy with themselves. It is also a feature of tyranny goes on. Okay, so cultivate fear, undermine trust, uh, preclude high thoughts, these are ways that you can preserve tyranny. Now, Aristotle never thought tyrants did a particularly good job at this. And I think Solzhenitsyn recognizes that tyrants can sustain themselves in exactly the same way Aristotle suggested. But in modernity, we have made advances in tyranny, ideology has been the key to unlocking tyranny and making it more tyrannical, undermining high thoughts, trust, encouraging lying and betrayals, okay? Now, lest, however, we think that modern tyranny is simply um, about violence against the people, I want to raise just one more discussion here of tyranny, and I think this is the greatest, the greatest discussion of tyranny. This is from Tocqueville. Um, Democracy in America, Volume 1, Part 2, Chapter 7, on the Omnipotence of the Majority in the United States. He has a section entitled, On the Power that the Majority in America Exercises Over Thought. Now, having been through something like this in my life, I have, always found, uh, I have since found this to be a very dramatic section of the book. Here's what he says about tyranny. He says, Princes had, so to speak, made violence material. Democratic republics in our day have rendered it just as intellectual as the human will that it wants to constrain. Under the absolute government of one alone, despotism struck at the body crudely so as to reach the soul, and the soul escaping from those blows rose gloriously above it, the ascent. But 
In democratic republics, tyranny does not proceed in this way. It leaves the body alone and goes straight for the soul. The master no longer says, you shall think as I do or you shall die. That's Stalin. He says, you are free not to think as I do. Your life, your goods, everything remains to you. But from this day on, you are a stranger among us, canceled. You shall keep your privileges in the city, but they will become useless to you. For if you crave the vote of your fellow citizens, they will not grant it to you. And if you demand only their esteem, they will still pretend to refuse it to you. You shall remain among men, but you shall lose your humanity. Go in peace, says the Democratic Republic. I leave you your life, but I leave it to you worse than death. So Solzhenitsyn, I think here, has in mind the spiritual effects of tyranny in the Soviet Union. That's the treatment of it and our muzzled freedom. And Tocqueville sees, I'm going to say, a gentler version of the gulag as something that defines modern democratic public opinion. It doesn't constrain your body. It doesn't build you a gulag. It's much more efficient than that. It prevents you from having thoughts contrary to the public opinion that is currently reigning. And if you do have such thoughts, you will be afraid to voice them and the next generation will never think them. Now, I think they're speaking, Tocqueville and Solzhenitsyn are speaking of the same phenomenon. Though, I do concede that Solzhenitsyn experienced that phenomenon in a different circumstance than any American ever would. Our tyranny is way better for the body. But does that mean it's way worse for the soul? <laughs> okay, now... These are things I'm putting in the background, all right, because, um, because I think these two chapters get at Solzhenitsyn's critique of tyranny, okay? His identification, his dissection of tyranny, and then his critique of tyranny. Okay, so let us, um, uh, oh, actually, I just want to do one more thing here. Uh, Go to 635 for those who have that. Uh, the, our, our muzzled freedom. What sustains tyranny according to, to Solzhenitsyn? That's just the question. It, it's number four, universal ignorance for those without, without the uh, complete edition. Um, number four, complete edition. He talks, he's, he's discussing the various characteristics of society outside the gulag. What is it like to live in the Soviet Union when you know you could at any moment be thrown into the abyss? One of the characteristics, he says, we're gonna go over these characteristics more carefully in a little bit, but just to hone in on this. Hiding things from each other and not trusting each other. We ourselves helped implement that absolute secrecy, absolute misinformation among us, which was the cause of causes that every, of everything that took place, including both the millions of arrests and the mass approval of them. So the secrecy, misinformation, the universal ignorance, however that's accomplished, there's a kind of willful ignorance where you don't want to know what's going on with your neighbor's house or you don't want to notice that your neighbor has disappeared. There's a kind of ignorance where you might actually try to seek out the truth of things, but if the truth of things goes against public opinion, that, that's not a truth you ever want to say, so you're better off never actually exploring that truth. Tyranny, and, and Aristotle says the same thing, right? High thoughts lop off the heads of the preeminent. That's, the cause, that, that's how tyrants maintain themselves. Universal ignorance is the cause of causes of a tyranny. All right, I'm, I think like 
th that's his statement that's very similar, I think, to both uh, Tocqueville and Aristotle. All right, as I say, my method is often to go to the end and come back to the beginning, and uh, so I want to do that, and I want us to start with why did we stand for it? Now, this is obviously a great question, right? It's a great question. It's a question that uh, people raised about the American slaves. Why did they stand for it? It was a very interesting, it's a very interesting historical phenomenon that there were so few slave revolts. The Spartans couldn't leave home without worrying that their slaves, the Helots, would revolt. And when they did leave home, the Helots revolted. There would be revolts every five, seven years, and the Spartans murdered Helots. But when you compare American slavery with Helot slavery, there's, there seem to have been less, fewer, excuse me, slave revolts. It's something that has to be explained. And this is the same thing took, uh, that, that Solzhenitsyn observes. Why did the Zek stand for it? They outnumbered the guards. Why not just go after them? Why were there so few? In fact, there doesn't seem to have been any kind of organized uprising against the Soviet authorities till the 50s. And Solzhenitsyn's claim is that the, uh, the gulag itself was coeval with the Soviet regime, which means it started in 1920, 30 plus years of very few revolts. You got some splaining to do, Lucy. You got some splaining to do. And that's the question he takes up in, uh, in, in this very interesting chapter, why did we stand for it? Now I want to start, once again, and I, I, I hate to be so weird, but I want to start at the end of this chapter because he, he gives an account, this is on page 93, of the four ways in which prisoners can object to their conditions. Does that make sense? Four ways in which prisoners can object to their conditions he says you can protest, you can engage in a hunger strike, you can try to escape, or you can engage in mutiny. Now when I went to Israel, um, I, went, uh, I, I spent a day inside of the prisons where they keep terrorists. And it was very interesting. And there were, there were in the cells about 70 terrorists and there were two guards. And here, all of us kind of plaid-wearing suburban dads from America are coming into this prison, and we're looking around, and like, yeah, this is, these are the most hardened terrorists we have here in Israel. And like, I believe that, right? I mean, I'm not, I don't think that they just dragged some guys off the street, they were just nice guys. These were people who were going to kill people, suicide bombers, recruiters, and all that stuff. And so we're walking in there, and we have this female guard, and we have this male guard who looked like he could rip the head off of any being. And, and, and I just said to him, like, well, it seems like we're really outnumbered here. And uh, why isn't there a mutiny? He goes, oh, there was one two years ago when there was a new warden. Uh, and they mutinied. They took one of our um, guards into, into a cell, locked it, and, uh, and thre threatened her. And within two minutes, everyone in this circle had a bone broken. One reason people don't mutiny is there's fear, <laughs> right? Fear from the guards. And uh, that's one way to put down a mutiny. Obviously, the mutiny is the best of the ways that you can resist against unjust rule. So we're gonna to want to, and in fact, next time, we're gonna talk entirely about mutiny, okay? But Solzhenitsyn, he tries to be comprehensive here. Why were there so few of these elements, protests, hunger strikes, escape, mutiny? Now, his answer to this, after listing the things that you could do, is as clear as the sun. So then it is obvious to everyone that the great deceased like to say, and if it isn't, he uh, will ram it into him, that if the first two have force and if the jailers fear them, it is only because of public opinion. Go back to the uh, two paragraphs above the, the, the list. The reason why we put up with it all in the camps 
is that there was no public opinion outside. Protest only works if there are ears outside the jail that want to hear and that will do something about it. Hunger strikes only work if there are people with conscience outside of it who recognize the injustice and will do something about it, put pressure on the authorities to change. Escape only works if the people around you are sympathetic or will help you. So without public opinion outside the gulag, the gulag becomes is more, I should say, is more likely to become a dispirited, monotonous lump of human beings who will do nothing to defend or protect themselves. It's not simply that the thieves have been brought in and the conditions are horrible. It's that there's no escape because there's no public opinion. Now, what or does that make sense to everyone? So what, what Solzhenitsyn does in this chapter is he compares the state of public opinion under Stalin to the state of public opinion under the czars. And he spends, I think, you know, three quarters of the chapter itself talking about what it was like to live in the last 50 years under the Romanovs. And his answer seems to be something like this. It was a walk in the park. They didn't go after their enemies. He gives this history of Lenin. I mean, Lenin was as, it was as obvious as it could be that he was a mortal threat to the regime. They caught him, what, three or four times? Did he ever get more than three years in anything? He took himself to exile. He could take jobs. He could run magazines from his exile. His brother tried to assassinate an official. Under Stalin, that gets the whole family wiped out. Under the Tsar, forgiveness. Now, that's a very interesting phenomenon. That the, and and, and I, I, we should just say one more thing about it. There was public opinion under the Tsar. That is, if someone was arrested, you go into exile, you want to escape? Can you get help? Absolutely. If you go on a hunger strike and you appeal to Western authorities or to the intelligentsia in Russia, will they support you? And will the czar back down? Yes, yes. A mere protest of the conditions that you live in would probably be enough to get you liberated. Now, um, you know, and, and so there's two things I want to read here uh, in, this, in this section, why did we stand for it? Uh, one of them is on page 81 in this, and it's just an account um, of, of um, why the czars failed. Um, it begins with the word with every year, that's where you find it in the reading, but I'm going to just skip down. Let's read the whole paragraph. It's a great paragraph. With every year of education and literary freedom, is that in, in the Peterson one? Oh, it could be somewhere. All right. Well, I'll, I'll just read it, but I'll read it with vim and vigor. With every year of education and literary freedom, the invisible but terrible power of public opinion grew until the czars lost their grip on both the reins and the mane. And Nicholas II could only clutch at crupper and tail. And it is true that the inertial undertow of dynastic tradition prevented him from understanding the demands of his age and that he lacked the courage to act. In the age of airplanes and electricity, he lacked all social awareness and thought of Russia as his own rich and richly variegated estate in which to levy tribute, breed stallions, and raise armies for a bit of war now and again with his imperial brother from the house of Hohenzollern. But neither he nor any of those who governed for him any longer had the will to fight for their power. They no longer crushed their enemies. They merely squeezed them gently and let them go. They were forever looking over their shoulders and straining their ears, 
What would public opinion say? They persecuted revolutionaries just sufficiently to broaden their circle of acquaintance in prisons, toughen them, and wring their heads with halos. We now have an accurate yardstick to establish the scale of these phenomena. And we can safely say that the czarist government did not persecute revolutionaries, but tenderly nurtured them for its own destruction, prepared its own grave diggers, if I can quote another German thinker. The uncertainty, half-heartedness, and feebleness of czarist government are obvious to all who have experienced an infallible judicial system. His own, right? So the, the critique or the account of the czar is that it's precisely the independent public opinion that sapped the will that he had to survive, to update his rule. He thought it was ineffectual to do so, okay? Now, a leader rises up, and there's a slight account of him in this chapter. Um, this is on page 89. A, a leader uh, who governed Russia from roughly 1906 to 1911. Um, he's not someone I had heard of at all until I read Solzhenitsyn, and then I did a lot of reading on him. His name's Pyotr Stolypin, S-T-O-L-Y-P-I-N. He was the, the Tsar's prime minister. He was interested in modernizing Russia, and he did, had basically a two-pronged attack. One, kill the revolutionaries, to update Russia. So while he was imposing martial law, that's called the Stolypin Terror on page 89, while he was imposing martial law, identifying the terrorists who were killing the public officials and bombing the trains and blackmailing landowners, he was identifying them, charging them, and convicting them under military tribunes. At the same time, Stolypin engaged in a development of Russia. Um, he took fallow land and distributed it to the peasants because he was trying to dry up the revolutionaries' attractiveness in the countryside. He said the future is with the peasants. The peasants are repulsed by the revolutionaries, but the czar gives them nothing. So build railroads, allow them to take things to market from their land, low interest loans, build a peasant class into a middle class. That's Russia's, doing both those things at the same time, that's Russia's way forward. And so he even made great progress. He actually ended the revolutionary activity during the time of his prime ministership. And uh, the martial law lasted nine months or something like that. But he was tough. He wanted the, he was the only one he wanted the czarist regime to continue, and he was hated. He was hated by who? By public opinion. The beautiful people hated him, right? And the most beautiful of the beautiful people was Tolstoy. Now, I want us to look at this on page 89. Tolstoy had the misfortune of living too long. If he would have died in 1906, Everyone would be like, great, you're a great guy. Solzhenitsyn never would have written anything against him. But he lived to 1913, which means he lived to see Stolypin and to make uh, something of himself. All right, so Stolypin, uh, Tolstoy complains about Stolypin's rule, right? He's a bumpkin. He is vulgar. He's willing to use force, right? I'm not saying he has orange hair and a long tie because he's way smarter than that, okay? I mean, he was an impressive guy. But Tolstoy has nothing but contempt for him. Here's what Tolstoy says. This is 89, why do we stand for it? Such were the circumstances um, in which Tolstoy came to believe that only moral self-improvement was necessary, not political freedom. So let's just, I wanna go back and make, and make sure I explain what, what, what the circumstances are. The czar allowed politics outside of his rule. He did nothing to counter the motions of public opinion, 
right? It was easy for people to escape. It was hunger strikes could get you somewhere. Public opinion existed. And it's under those conditions that Tolstoy came to believe that political freedom wasn't necessary, only moral self-improvement, which sounds a little bit like the ascent. Okay, the ascent is an example of moral self-improvement. Tolstoy seems to agree that the only thing that's necessary is moral self-improvement, not political freedom. All right, then the critique of Tolstoy, here we go. Of course, no one is in need of freedom if he already has it. We can agree with him, Tolstoy, that political freedom is not what matters in the end. The goal of human evolution is not freedom for the sake of freedom, nor is it building of an ideal polity. What matters, of course, are the moral foundations of society. But that is in the long run. What about the beginning? What about the first step? Yasnaya Polyana, that's Tolstoy's estate. Okay, he's referring to where Tolstoy had his discussions about the necessity of moral self-improvement. In those days was an open club for thinkers. But if it had been blockaded, as Alkmotnovna's apartment was when every visitor was asked for his passport, if Tolstoy had been pressed as hard as we all were in Stalin's time, when three men feared to come together under one roof, even he would have demanded political freedom. So, Tolst oh, excuse me, Solzhenitsyn is not a liberal. And what I mean by that is for him, freedom is not the goal. Freedom is not the goal of a political society. But it's a necessity for any political society to be a good one. All of these people, who, like Tolstoy, who criticized political freedom, did so not realizing that they had it. They were living in a luxurious condition where they could actually think about what matters, moral self-improvement, the moral foundations of society. And they totally lack the perspective of what a genuine tyranny is and how that genuine tyranny compromises political freedom. Okay? So he even saves Tolstoy, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. By saying, he's like a little child who lacked perspective. If he would be put in the gulag now, he might question whether Stalin was a good guy. And he might even begin to wonder whether the revolutionaries were right or where it was at. He continues, I mean, these are one of these things, you just almost never wanna speak after you read this, right? Um, at the most dreadful moment of the Stoipan terror, when he was imposing, when he imposed martial law, the liberal newspaper Rus was allowed to report in bold type on its front page, five executions, 20 executed at Kershon. Tolstoy broke down and wept. In that he couldn't go on, and said that he could not go on living. That it was, quote, impossible to imagine anything more horrible. Later on, in one of these great, you know, like, he, Solzhenitsyn has a way of presenting things. He says, I'm just trying to find it here. It is actually quite imaginable that you could find something worse. <laughs> but maybe not to someone like Tolstoy. All right, are we in good shape? So, most of that discussion is not in the piece. Okay, yeah, it's too bad. Uh, the, the Tolstoy, I mean, I'm a big fan of Tolstoy. Mr. Arthur has been in a class with me. Um, but, you know, so Tolstoy wrote between seven, uh, 1870 and, you know, when he died, uh, but let's say his, his, uh, his uh, sweet spot was 1870 to 1890. 
He never really took the revolutionary seriously. Dostoevsky, they're in his books. He presents them. He shows how they grow. He shows how they get stopped. Tolstoy was looking at the same phenomenon and wrote one of the, some of the best books about marital love and some real critiques about decent bourgeois life, but never really took the dark darkness of the revolutionary series. You can kind of see why, um, why that might be the case um, from what Solzhenitsyn presents here. So, all right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the file under don't get the Peterson book, or at least make my students read the whole chapter um, on uh, Solzhenitsyn. All right, are we, are, are we good? Any questions on that? All right, so what's the upshot of this? Let's just make sure we understand the upshot of it. The gulag is, the, the prisoners in the gulag are complacent because Russian society lacks political freedom, right? No possibility of escaping, protesting, hunger striking, very difficult time imagining a successful mutiny. Those are the options. But it's a perfect circle, right? Because why is public opinion so hostile to the people in the gulag? And the answer from our muzzled freedom is the existence of the gulag destroys public opinion, inhibits the freedom of everyone outside of it. Now, our muzzled freedom, damn, it might be the best chapter in the book. And um, it, it's certainly the most political, or at least the greatest work of a kind of political reflection on the effect of tyranny on its people, okay? Aristotle's tyrants didn't have gulags. When you go through the checklist, he has, what, 10 things that our muzzled freedom has accomplished? You find them in Aristotle. Constant fear, check, servitude, I didn't read that one, but check. Secrecy and mistrust. Squealing. Lies, or betrayal as a form of existence. Lies as a form of existence. It's all in Aristotle. If Aristotle had just thought of the gulag, he could have had better recommendations for his tyrants to go all the way. But do the math. No tyranny without gulags, no gulags without ideology, right? And Aristotle knew neither gulags nor ideology. So this is an improvement in tyranny. And perhaps the spiritual tyranny of democratic republics is an improvement over the gulag. They're of interest. So let's look at some of the main ones. All right. I want, to hit, I want to hit on four. First, constant fear. At any moment, you can be sent to the gulag for any wink, for any silence. The story, I don't know how many guys saw the great movie, The Death of Stalin. It's a, the, the funniest comedy about totalitarianism. Since um, Mel Brooks... Uh, what was the one where he comes out of Poland? I can't remember. That was also pretty funny. The Death of Stalin, very sophisticated humor. Um, they, they redo the clapping scene that's, that uh, Solzhenitsyn famously tells. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, annual meetings of the Soviet Union, the speech ends, everyone starts clapping. No one wants to be the first one to stop. They're being watched. It's obvious they're being watched. It goes on for five, 10, 12 minutes. Finally, some guy, like, coughs, <coughs> stops, gulag, right? I mean, that's, like, 12 minutes of clapping is more than I've ever done. Um, I'm guessing it wasn't the greatest speech, but nevertheless, it's, it's an example of why this population from top to bottom was in constant fear of being sent to the abyss in the gulag. Um, his, his account of that uh, ends with this very important line. This is on page uh, 634 for those with that. 
Peace of mind is something our citizens have never known. These are people outside the gulag. And I think Solzhenitsyn's view comes to be there's more freedom in the gulag than outside the gulag. The people outside the gulag have things to lose that tether them to trying to keep up appearances. They have property, they have apartments, they have jobs, they have wives, they have children. The advantage that the people in the gulag have is that everything has been stripped away. So, they're the dangerous man with nothing left to lose. Constant fear one attribute of life outside of it. The next one we've talked about, universal ignorance. The cause of causes. Uh, many of you are too young to remember jokes about Pravda, um, but you know, it, it was widely known among the Soviet Union that the only thing you, would, you, you were not to believe was the official party newspaper of Pravda, which means truth. Like, so if they said it's been a record year for harvest, the only thing you knew was that you're going to starve that winter, right? And there was no, there was no, it, but that was the, the plan, was to keep the entire population ignorant of public and private affairs of one another. The next one, very important and interesting, is this betrayal as a form of existence. Now, Solzhenitsyn tells several stories here. The essence of his stories uh, come down to the idea that betrayal is kind of a continuum. You can squeal on someone, that's a form of betrayal. And that form of betrayal is generally thought to be the lowest of the low when it comes to vices. The, the lowest circle of Dante's hell is for traitors. But, it's a continuum. What do you do when your neighbor's child, when your neighbor's disappears and his child no longer has a parent? Do you take care of that orphan? Or do you, out of fear, ignore him? Many ignored him. And, um, uh, Solzhenitsyn says of those who would ignore orphans, contemporaries, fellow citizens, do you recognize here your own swinish faces? The suggestion that, to, uh, that uh, Solzhenitsyn makes historically is that the, so, the, the people of Russia helped one another out and resisted quietly until 1937. And after that, the people was pretty broken. That is, all of these attributes, the betrayal, the universal ignorance, the servitude, became much more pervasive. But, uh, and this is on the bottom of 640, this is just pointing in directions uh, for, for the last chapter we're going to look at next week. Um, yet even this was not yet the end of our society. As we see today, the end never did come. The living thread of Russia survived, hung on until better times came in 1956, and it is now less than ever likely to die. The resistance was not overt. It did not beautify the epoch of the universal fall. But with its invisible warm veins, its heart kept on beating, 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 beating. All right, so uh, betrayal was a normal, uh, normal piece of, uh, a normal ethic uh, of the people of Russia. Uh, it's one of the ways that they handled trying to stay out of the gulag. The last and most important, I think, of the, of the elements is called the lie as a form of existence. Now, there's a couple of um, 
Once again, lying is on a continuum. There's the overt lie where you tell an untruth, but as important, there's the withholding of truth or the withholding of your opinion or letting your mouth speak while your heart goes in a different direction. Um, he calls this, he says that the permanent lie, this is on page 646, about four, fourth pa paragraph into this, <clears throat> The permanent lie becomes the only safe form of existence in the same way as betrayal. Every wag of the tongue can be overheard by someone, every facial expression observed by someone. Therefore, every word, if it does not have to be a direct lie, is nonetheless obliged not to contradict the general common lie. That's the most powerful thing that exists. The general common lie derived from the reigning ideology cannot be contradicted unless you want to be a bumpkin or a lick spittle for the old regime. So there's a lie. Everyone knows it's a lie. Um, uh, and contradicting it leads to oblivion. The oblivion can be the gulag. The oblivion can be, you can't find a job. The Solzhenitsyn view, the Tocqueville view. But in each case, it's a lie that can't be contradicted. He gives examples of how you go about conforming to the general common lie. There exists, he says, a collection of ready-made phrases and labels, a selection of ready-made lies. Anybody have to take a training recently for your jobs? That's some of their own business owners here. That's too bad. You guys all work for sensible things. He continues, um, uh, and not a single speech, nor one single essay or article, nor a single book, be it scientific, journalistic, critical, or literary so-called, can exist without the use of these primary cliches. In the most scientific of texts, it is required that someone's false authority or false priority be upheld somewhere, and that someone be cursed for telling the truth. Without this lie, even an academic work cannot see the light of day. We call that peer review. And what can be said about those shrill meetings and trashy lunch break gatherings where you are compelled to vote against your opinion, to pretend to be glad over what distresses you, be it a new state loan, the lowering peace rates, and so on, and to express the deepest anger in areas about which you couldn't care less. Some kind of intangible, invisible violence in the West Indies or Paraguay are the examples he gives. I, I, I like this next one, so I'm just going to... No man who has typed even one page without lying. There is no man who has spoken from a rostrum without lying. There is no man who has spoken into a microphone without lying. Now, once again, let's just trace this, trace the logic here. No public... Uh, no gulag without public opinion. No gulag without ideology. No ideology without lies. Now, we should be specific, I'm trying to be specific about what we mean by lies. We don't mean things that are um, with, uh, impossible to be true, all right? We, or inconceivable. We mean things which simply aren't true. In, uh, if, if stated more moderately, they could be true. If stated more uh, with, uh, with words like up to a point, they could be true. But the lie is very connected to the whole idea of ideology, which can never capture the full complexity of human life. Okay? Let's, let, let's try to put a bow on this whole thing. One of the key aspects of what an ideology is, we've talked, we talked about this at the beginning last time, and I mentioned two things, a kind of destruction of the old and an inflating of one good at the expense of all the other goods. There's a third element that uh, Solzhenitsyn talks about in the book, and that is a belief 
that everything that has happened up to this point in history in the world is darkness. And once this ideology is adopted, we'll have nothing but light. This comes through, I think, quite strongly in the chapter on why do we stand for it, where he says, well, what were the czars before the revolution? Well, it was nothing but blackness, according to the revolutionaries. Never a good guy, only tyrants. Crushing, crushing, crushing. Our history is nothing but rape and pillage and batterings and murder. But... There's a promise of liberation in an ideology where the good can be achieved once we've emancipated or unshackled ourselves from the old. That, I think, is probably the chief lie of every ideology.